Justin Bourne, Real Kipper and Bourne, Leafs Regional. What's up, brother? How are we doing? I'm doing well, man. How are you? You want to weigh in on Siakam? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to, Every day you, I, yeah. I go into the Raptor yeah. show, they're on before yeah. us, and I'm like, what's up what What did they Raptor talk about show? today? I know. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, listen, we all go through this in the business, right? Like, we've all had, I've had summers of Blue Jays where, you know, it's 2017, 2018, and you got to go, okay, what, what, what am I going to do today, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think, There's yeah. nothing good going on. No. And the worst part is that they clearly stink. So, but people always have to like overhype the wins because there's so few moments of joy that you have to be like, yeah. well, this was really great about it. And you're like, was it though? Was Buddy, it? At least their sweet spot. They're both yes. good and flawed. It yes. could not be better. Okay. Well, <laughs> all right. You know what? I'm starting with this. I'm starting all with right. this now. Cause I texted you yesterday. I, I, I said after the last Leafs talk, which got a lot of the crybabies upset, I was notified that the, the chat did not like this, but I called them the just enough team where that's kind of their identity this season is that they find yeah. just enough to get into overtime. They find just enough to collect a point or two. You look at the standings. They're right there. They're only a couple points behind Boston. They're, I think as of today, they're still top three, right? Yeah. That's anyway, they're, they're one of the better teams record wise in the entire NHL. And yet no one could argue that it's been a spectacular season for the Toronto Maple Leafs, right? You look at all of their underlying numbers. They're basically a middle of the pack team across the board. Like find me the stat. I, I've asked analytics guys, like find me the stat that I'm missing here. That tells me that there's something special about this team. And there, there really isn't right. They've there's, yeah. They, they're, like, is there one to you? There's a stat that really stinks up to you other than like well, Nylander and Matthews points. Yeah. You know, I open uh, Sport Logic has this like the, their back end, this like Sport Logic IQ back end site, and the first thing is just a graph, a, a plot graph of all the teams. On the bottom is expected goals for per sixty. Yeah, you know that's going along the bottom. Then going up is expected goals against per sixty. So top right quadrant is where the good player yep. teams are. Bottom right bad teams. Sharks are bad. Bottom left can't barely even on the graph. They're so Sharks far are gone hot, though. Yeah, the, <laughs> fair. The Leafs. We're kind of in the middle of the graph in everything for the mm -hmm. first month of the season. Mm -hmm. And every game now, they tick farther right of expected goals. Right, 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 right. Now there's Good only trend. two teams two teams ahead of them. Well, the I mean, Devils might be ahead. It's a perception thing. But two or three teams ahead of them. So they're, they're creating offense now like an elite team. They're still below the line in terms of expected goals for, uh, against. So yeah. there's, they still don't defend a lick which last past few years, they've been one of the best defensive teams. So, but at least they're producing offense again. Yeah. And I, I just feel like so much of that has to do with Austin Matthews regressing back to who he's supposed to be. Right. <laughs> like, I, it's he's a, the weirdest guy on the Leafs where it's like, he's leading the league in goals and he has yeah. two streaks of se more than seven games without a goal. Yeah. Yeah. We've gone through, Oh my God, he's putting it all together again to, Oh my God, he's back into last season mode. Is he hurt? to, oh my God, is this just a guy who has told us now that he's not going to try for certain stretches or not going to be able to engage for certain stretches? I don't know really what to make of Matthews' this season. I'm trying to give him, and I was theorizing this yesterday actually with Versteeg, is I think he is a rhythm player. And mm. with the, all the breaks in the Leafs schedule, whether it's been the breaks with Sweden, the break coming back, the weirdness of as soon as they get back, they have five days off in between games. I, I think it's hard for her, or harder for him to stay engaged in that. I actually think that this schedule that we have now, like December moving forward where the Leafs play a ton of games, this is why you're seeing, or partially why you're seeing a better Matthews mm -hmm. and why you're going to continue to see this version of him. I also just think, you know, 82 game season, let's say we were following, following yeah. Pasternak or Kucherov or, you know, whoever else you think is the best uh, offensive producer, maybe McDavid's the exception here, but mm -hmm. generally there are stretches of games where it just doesn't go in for you. And yeah. I know he, it's not like he has played as well and it wasn't going in. He definitely looked like a different player over those stretches, but you know, we do need to kind of sometimes dial it back. Like, you know, on our show for a while, it was uh, Matthews needs to hit more. Okay. Well, he's got like twice his career average in hits this year. And you know, you Kipper grinds him once in a while. He needs more assists. It's like, well, if he did all these things, He'd be the best player in the history of the game. Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes expectations just need to maybe dial back a little bit. This is a hundred point player is going to score 60 times, you know, and, and yeah, maybe he's not going to win the heart trophy, but he's going to be pretty damn valuable along the way. Okay. So this, this feeds into the question that I texted you last night, which is okay. The Leafs have been underwhelming. There's just no doubt about it. Right. There's been a lot of ups and downs with this team yeah. between like, 
the Klingberg signing, what they were getting from Domi to start the year, and what they were getting from Bertuzzi to start the year, trying to figure out the lines, the line shufflings, the, hey, Nylander's going and none of the other superstars are, the Mitch Marner struggles, right? The goaltending well, issues. And, and I'll add to that, J.D., yeah. like the best goal differential teams, the Kings are plus 30, Canucks are 37, Knights yeah. are 32, you know, they're plus 10. Yeah. The, the, the Leafs are plus 10. They kind of, they're getting their wins, but they're not running away with these games. Right. Okay. So the, the goal differential, all these different issues that we've gone over, but then they do sit there in the standings. And like you said, they're starting to make positive inroads in terms of their expected goals for, which is, I think, kind of one of the most accepted measures that we've now all agreed upon is an important one. Mm-hmm. Are they, do you think that they've actually gotten enough credit for this season? That's an interesting thought about it. You know, every time someone, the, the, the PR spin they put on it was, uh, you know, every time someone came to them and said, you only have five regulation wins or six regulation wins tied to the San Jose Sharks, what do you think? They, they started coming back with, yeah, well, we've also lost five times in regulation, which is the, the fewest times in the league. You know, no one is beating us outright either. And as much as that is a fun PR angle, it's a good point too. You know, they're not going, they don't seem to have these nights off where they're just dead in the water, complete no-shows, and they get lumped up. They kind of hang around the games they don't play great in. And more recently, and only more recently, are we seeing some games where, like Nashville and the Rangers where they get some separation and they win going away. So, you know, I think there's a fair point to be made that right now they're, uh, you know, fifth in the NHL in points percentage and probably could use a little tip of the cap for the success they've had uh, in a fairly tumultuous season with injuries and some struggling players. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just... We keep we always measure the the Leafs team of this year versus the Leafs team of last year, which is surprising because most seasons it's like they were bounced in the first round, and even last year they get through it, but it was still embarrassing the way they lost. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. So somehow, so, but but that was the whole discussion point was the Leafs are worse now than they were a year before. The Leafs are worse now than they were a year before, and I start to look at them and go, Hey, is if you're looking for the regular season as a test, right? Which you should, mm-hmm. because that's why we get highs and lows is there's really no stakes. They're going to show up They're They're probably going to make the playoffs. They're going to accumulate points. It's the test, right? What is yep. this going to look come playoff time? I think that you could make the case and I'm not even trying to say that, like, I'm not trying to overstate it, but I get frustrated when they have these slow starts, right? Cause I look at that as, Hey, this is continuing a pattern of, the same reason that has cost them come postseason time. I've looked at some of the goaltending that they've had this year, wool aside with Samsonov and gone, this is not a goaltender that's going to get enough done for you. The blue line talent, the lack of right shot defensemen, whatever, the lack of a third line center. The things that you look at and say, why not, why not, why not? I usually get frustrated when they come back in some of these games and they show some resiliency and they tie it up mm-hmm. against a team, right? Or that they show a game against the Rangers and they, they pop at the very beginning of the period. If we're doing the test, could you not make the case that they've actually shown quite a bit of resiliency by getting all of these games to overtime and finding ways to accumulate these points despite like a large set of pretty unfortunate circumstances? Yeah, I think so. You know, the only case I would make against it is just they are so much worse defensively than they've been. You know, like they you're right that there is some good sort of psychological factors at play where they don't go away and they stay in games and their best players are having great seasons and getting them through and all that. That's great. You know, you don't, don't want to go into playoffs, be the Bruins, have no adversity and then mm-hmm. falter. But I do think that like, okay, if they get Lilligren and Giordano back, are, is it a good decor then? Like, I still feel like they just need some help. Like Domi, not a great defensive player. Robertson's not like a lot of the new guys. Reeves isn't. Um, and a couple, you know, fill-in guys on the blue line are doing a good job. I just worry that, yes, there is a lot to believe that this team is close to being able to take a step and get better and be more playoff ready, but they just cannot be this bad defensively and win the playoffs. The, I, I think right now, for me, the issue that I'm just hyper-fixated on is they've got all these defensemen who are good, not great, yeah. and you just wish that you could combine a couple of them into a guy. Right. Just, yeah. You wish you could just smash a couple of them together like you're playing with, I don't know, Play-Doh and then build a, a new uh, a new guy that's better than the guys they have. It's, it's a team that is just chock full of dudes who would be a good fifth, sixth to fifth to seventh defenseman. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, boy, have they done a great job of accumulating fifth to seventh defenseman. So true. It is so true. And that's, you know, one thing the, uh, that's the bright spot back there is McCabe mm-hmm. has taken a step for me. 
You know, like he last year in playoffs, he came in, they asked him to be the shutdown guy, and it just looked like it was too much for him at times. And I have felt this year that going back on pucks, he's making really good plays with it. Not just the physical play that everyone's talking about, but their record before he came back, he was hurt and they went like, I don't know, like two and seven or something or whatever their roughest stretch was. And then he came back and they've been unbelievable since. So that's the one guy who no longer looks like a five to seven to me as much as, uh, again, my co-host doesn't agree there. I I like McCabe quite a bit. I think he's solid. Um, I think that forcing him to go play his offside has hampered the whole I'm jumping up in the rush thing now because he can't play the puck the same way. But also one of the things that I've just been hyper fixated on lately is that they, okay, We went from there was the Babcock era of like you got to have lefty righty on the blue line to the point where people felt like, oh, well, they're just not even going to get any a good enough talent because they're going to hyper focus on this. Right. Like they overvalued a guy like Zaitsev to now this era where you watch these games and you go, this matters a lot. Part of the reason why they're bad defensively is that when they make D to D passes, it's like Brody and McCabe are always catching it Mm -hmm. on their offside or offhand. And then trying to make some kind of like backhanded pressure breakout with their back turned to a four checker and like desperation trying to get a puck out. And, and yeah. I feel like if they can just find a way to get McCabe over to his correct side and replace this team with a, a like not replace this team, replace one guy in their top four with an actual sturdy, like nice right shot defenseman, the yeah. pieces really, you could see the pieces falling into place. You and I used to do this analogy of you've got some talent, but the pieces don't fit together. That's how I feel about all the left-handed shots right now. Yeah. I, you know, it's uh, maybe our longest running theme of having worked together, covering the Leafs is just, they haven't had a decor way where you went that fits. Yeah. You know, these okay, are the you pairings have- that make sense. Yes, they have, you have lefty, righty, you have clear certain pair of guys, you have guys that can shut it down, you have guys who can produce offense. Like They haven't put together a decor like that, and you know we know part of that is because they have invested so heavily up front, but it definitely is at a, a pressure point for tree living this year. Mm-hmm. Like The one thing that's not happening is we're not having this conversation March 10th, and this is the decor. Like that's, There's not a chance. It is the same guys with no new additions. I don't know. I'm not saying they're going to be better, but there's going to be, I think, two new additions to this decor, whether by a trade or waiver claim or whatever. But there's going to be different bodies back there. Yeah, there has to be. What's yeah. What's funny though is like I'm not. The, there's a couple painful parts of it, which is you you got to put Giordano back in there, and he was playing well this year. But I keep thinking, is Benoit better? You know, is Lagason? a better long time. I like, I, I like both guys. So, I genuinely so do, I. do. Like, I do wonder if, all right, it's game 26 tonight. Yeah. Like if they play 50 games more or four, yeah. you know, like do, do they find it a little bit? Cause they, they are physical, bigger guys who yep. prioritize defending buddy. So the penalty kill was a nightmare to start the season. Mm. Just an abject nightmare. I remember it I had was. Jason Buchel on and I went, how does this team improve the penalty kill? And he said, I don't think they can because they don't have defenders who are physical enough Mm -hmm. and who can make movements in small spaces, right? Quick, tight spaces, movements. And then they got those two guys. And there's a lot of discussion right now about Gregor, right? And how he's become a great penalty killer and all all credit to him. And I I think that Sheldon Keefe does that well and he identifies for us. He's got a good skill set for it. But I really do believe that part of the reason that the penalty kill has taken such a drastic uptick is that they added two guys with size, physicality, and who move just a, a little bit better than the dudes that they had before. And it has mm-hmm. really helped them out. Like when I look at this team, that's one of the interesting things about the blue line is, okay, we agree that they've got a surplus of five to seven guys, right? Yeah. But who are the, the, who are the guys that you want to remove from the equation? Timmons? <laughs> well, yeah, but that's the easiest. Like, yeah, you just, we're, we're playing a game and you just took the easy answer. And then yeah, I'm left. Sorry. It's like, okay, who's the second overall pick? I'm yeah. like, ah, oh. <laughs> yeah. I got yeah. nothing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's hard to do, right? It's, it's not as easy as you think. Even when Lilligren comes back, it's like, okay, Timmons. Nice. Now say Giordano comes back. What are you doing? Where are the guys mm-hmm. going? Where are they fitting? Okay. You want McCabe on his natural side, which you should, despite him playing better and despite some of the reasons in terms of holding him back and making him a bit more conservative, ultimately you would like to see McCabe on his proper side. Like yeah. where do the pieces fit? And I, I, I've looked at it a million times and I cannot tell you day to day where I sit outside of, 
I actually think that they should keep a space for those two guys and continue to have some research and develop and development into what they actually have there from those two bottom pairing dudes. Yeah, Legison on Benoit's shoulder yeah. in a trench coat is yeah. ideal. You know, yes. like if, if you combine a couple of these guys, but you're right. So that that will be a development to watch. And part of the reason, you know, I had been clamoring for them to make a trade and not let these guys sort of expose you for the weak decor that you have. Mm -hmm. I guess there's some reason to say, hey, maybe we're going to just hold tight for a month and see if these guys can play at this level sustainably. Like you think about Holmberg too, you know, like eventually these guys, if they can't do it, they show you eventually, right? Mm-hmm. You just got to let play them long enough. And um, yeah, they, <laughs> they, they haven't had that sort of run yet. I forgot about Holmberg in terms of just the, the lengths. It was what Kip, Kipper had him getting offer sheeted. Yeah, yeah, he was playing pretty good at that time. <laughs> yeah, I know you guys loved him. He was all your we favorite loved him. player. He, he was. He was I mean, the uh, show's favorite player. I know. Player. Really was the Holmberg's. Like, I'm wow, still what a team fun. Bobby McMahon. So I don't yeah. always make great decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, hey, but listen, yeah, I. It's funny though because I, I think that's been more of a statement of some of the guys that they've had as depth forwards on this team. That mm-hmm. someone comes in and just has a, a skill set, and you go, oh, mm-hmm. I, I, this is a guy. He he could do funny. a thing. That's a fourth liner, though. A yeah. fourth liner is a guy who can do a thing. Yeah, but that's it. If he could do multiple things. Yeah. He's not a fourth liner. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. He can do a thing. Yeah. It's, we used to have, is he a guy? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, we gave Holmberg guy status very, very quickly. Uh, yet another. Did, did we? Yeah. yeah. We yeah. guyed up Engvall. We were the first to guy up Engvall. I know. We, we ended we, up with a seven year contract. So yeah. We'll take that win. Yeah. I will say, though, that we guyed up Engvall. And then the second we gave him, you know, we made him a made man, we turned on him immediately. <laughs> oh, high. yeah. How oh, could yeah. we have guy status to you? He's <laughs> 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 like the Pesci situation in Goodfellas. It was like, yeah, you're made, but it's in this basement. And oh, no. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, yeah. I, I will tell you that my favorite Leafs thing is watching Canadians games and people calling uh, Slavkovsky, Slovakian Engvall. I think yeah, that is a hilarious comparison. Oh, damn, that's so good. I, I wish know. I wish that was mine first. I would have killed <laughs> for that. I really would have. Uh, okay, so yeah, we touched on the blue line. We touched on this team. Not getting, I just, I, I do think they have the luxury of time now, which is, to me, weirdly putting more pressure on tree living because it's like, dude, you don't have to make a panic trade, right? You mm-hmm. did the right thing and not just adding Zadorov and eating up your salary cap space. I know everybody freaked out about that, but it was the right thing to do. They didn't need another guy. That was a five to seven dude. Uh, and they did, they found mm-hmm. kind of their own Zadorov, hopefully, or something close to it in Benoit. Um, yeah, maybe Tanev is the answer. I do think that that's like uh, slightly underwhelming, if not the most obvious answer, but it is going to be curious if the market opens up or there's a guy, there's a name that becomes available that they really feel like is going to be a, a significant piece on that blue line. Like it feels like that is the most obvious thing that in a center and whether or not he can get those two things done. So I'm like, yeah, maybe there is a bit more to this team. Maybe we can be a bit more optimistic about them. Um, I, I also think I'll just add that yeah. uh, the team they're chasing in Boston is not good. I should say not good. They're not very good. You know, they're, yeah, they're, they're not okay. last year's Boston. They're not, they're okay. Yeah. They're, they got their D or sorry, their forwards are considerably worse than the Leafs. Mm-hmm. Um, Florida's probably better than Boston. I was going to say that I feel like Boston isn't as good as their record indicates, but that the Panthers are, they've completely rolled last year's playoff run into who they actually yep. are. The the lightning as it was e- like a pretty easy prediction have taken a pretty significant step back. I don't, and I, but I do think the red wings are like an interesting, good team as well. Like yeah. In, yeah. They're, like I think that they're around it. They're, they're okay too. They're definitely like a wild card contender. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, yeah. Florida. The, the big thing is like Boston does have Boston's goalies. Like mm-hmm. they do have all Mark and Swayman as much as like, it's just the goalies. It's like, well, they get to play and so, a blue line that fits that you can rely upon. Yes. A very good, it's a tough team to, yeah. to crack uh, when you're trying to score. So they're, yeah. they're good there, but yeah, you play a lot of two, one games against them. Okay. So I wanted to talk about your, uh, your latest article, but instead I'm just going to tell people to go read it. Cause I think there's a lot of smart stuff there. Cause we're kind of running out of time here. Uh, yeah, but you have an article that's up on sportsnet.ca right now that's really great. Uh, it's the NHL is caught between two eras, or sorry, two generations, you wrote it, when it comes to physicality. And I, I think a lot of fans feel what you're seeing. I just might not be as optimistic as you about um, the future of the league in terms of the way that they're going to ensure it stays a big part of the game. Um, but yeah, mm. I would implore people to go read that because I, I do think that that's a big, big talking point in the league right now. But I had to, I've done Tavares all week. And so I'm sure some people feel like, dude, get, stop it. You know, please, we get it. Um, yeah. 
my position has pretty much been that, yeah, he's a good player and he's a very consistent player with the Leafs, but he just had his second greatest moment as a Toronto Maple Leaf by scoring his 1,000th career point on the island, right? And it was mm-hmm. a cool moment, but let, like that, what you name the third, right? Like name the third Tavares thing. When I asked Myrtle to do it, he mentioned the first game he came back to Toronto after being booed by the Islanders fans, right? I went, okay, that's kind of telling, right? Or he John mentioned Tavares Day in the city. Thanks, right, John Tory. Exactly, right? Like a cringy thing that happened because we felt the need to stick up for someone who got eleven million dollars to play in the city he loved. <laughs> it was very weird. Yeah. Um, yeah, he got hurt in a playoff series against Montreal. It was it was crap. That that stands out to me as like a missed opportunity, right? Yeah, like right. A what been... if? It's yeah. a, it's a what if. But outside of that, it's the 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 game the game winning goal against Tampa, which is the clear number one. And then now number two, it's that you know getting a point to force an overtime and then losing there. I mean, and, the whole season, his first year here, scoring forty seven yep. times with Mitch is was good. But, yeah, but that was I know great. it's not a moment. Yeah, but that's the only time he's made an all-star team in six seasons with the Toronto Maple Leafs, and it's really been the only season where he's felt like the guy that they were in, that they were taking from the Islanders, which was like this force, this dominant player. And mm. all, it got me thinking. Okay, there's a there's a real path back for his legacy here in Toronto, which is either he wins or he helps facilitate more winning on his next contract by being like. Uh, Giordano slash Spezza plus 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 where he goes, right. you know what? I'm going to be a winger, but I'm going to actually leave like $4 million a year on the table. And I'm going to play for essentially nothing to remain the captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs into my, you know, late thirties, which I think he should be able to do given his style of play. So there's a cool secondary element to his career here where he can really ingratiate himself to the fan base where he can become uh, like a far more memorable and beloved captain. But you're an Islanders guy. Like, you know, this is the, the team in which you grew up. You know, you're mm-hmm. you and your wife. You're Islanders royalty. Do you think there's a path back for him there? Because, dude, he did a lot. He was a really important Islander for a really long time. And when I was yeah. looking at his stats, like, it's going to be hard for him to pass his Islander stats with the Maple Leafs. Like, well, yeah, it's a good question. And I do think that there is a path back because I think, once you step away from the emotion, like right now, I think there's still some uncertainty for Islanders fans. Like if he mm. wins a cup in Toronto, I don't know if they're going to forgive him. Like okay. it could really, it could really affect things. But let's so say if he, he cements does, his Toronto legacy, his Islanders legacy is completely it. dead. But if he stinks with the Leafs or he runs up his next contract, like he goes back and he's an Islander. Like he's between these yeah. two realities. Yeah, I think that's true. You know, I, I think that is the story is that his story is not yet finished there is still an ending that is going to you know shape how we look back at his legacy and you know this is a guy who has put up points for so long Mm -hmm. that if he tacks on team winning at any point you go god he did all this and he won Mm -hmm. or you know that's that's going to be and if it doesn't happen you say he did all this and it didn't happen but he did it in long island or on long island where you know, they were in Barclays and they were yeah. in Nassau Coliseum and he didn't complain and they had no one to play with. And he made stars out of Matt Molson and, you know, JP Pajot and yeah. all these guys. And it's, it's a different look at what he did for a team when they were in the darkness. Yeah. I, I hope it's uh, like, I like that. I respect that that fan base booze McKee and I did it on Leafs talk. I really do. I, I don't care. I think an athlete should be able to withstand it. I would have, I, like if I was in the building and I was a fan, I think I would have stood and clapped for the 1,000th point, but they also did yeah. just tie the game, like whatever. I just I didn't think it was like a moral crisis in sport. No. Uh, I went, yeah, it's sports. Uh, this is kind yeah. of fun. It's a great discussion point. But I do hope that at the end of his career, something that, yeah, a place where he scored over 600 points and made multiple all-star teams and, yeah, won a playoff round, that, that, that the fans will say, hey, you, thank you for carrying us through that dark period for a little while. Plus, isn't he super – I'm pretty sure he's a major charity guy there too, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So he just can't win a cup in Toronto and he'll be fine. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, Justin Ford. <laughs> go read his article. Go listen to him later today on Real Kipper and Bourne. And, of course, watch him on Leafs Regional Games. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, bud. Chat See later. Uh, Justin Bourne.